I love this foundation. I think it's one of the most important foundations in the United States for advocacy and education for spinal cord injury. And they're going to make me work hard this time. I'm going to do two talks. Um, but I'll do more if you'd like. But uh, the first talk I'm going to give is a, a talk about some exciting new work uh, using a, what we call a peptide to inhibit chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan inhibition. Um, and I hope you're going to be as excited about this as, as we are. So I always start my talk with this slide from Ramoni Cajal. I'll I use this slide to point. I hope you all can see it. Uh, it's hard for me to go back and forth. So if you look at the tips of the axons that have been cut in the spinal cord in a cat, what they do is they, they first die back a few segments. And they form these funny little dystrophic-like endings which Cajal thought degenerated and were removed over time. But we now know that these tips of these cut axons of all fiber tracts persist in the lesion for the rest of your life. Uh, they sit there in the white matter. Some will die back to a sustaining collateral, but most just sit in the white matter uh, forever. And the question is, why do they do that? How do they do that? If the environment of the spinal cord is so hazardous, hostile, how can they persist? And I'll tell you a little bit about how they do that. Um, and the question is, how can we wake them up, especially after chronic injury stages, and get them to regenerate? But the good news is that they're still all there. And um, we'll talk a lot about these and what causes them to form. Now, there are many hypotheses that have been put forth over many, many hundreds of years to explain regeneration failure mechanical walls in the glial scar, a lack of trophic support, the water level has gone down, a lack of intrinsic growth support inside the neuron, which you heard about this morning, P10, KLF factors, um, may be reduced in the adult neuron so they can't grow very well intrinsically, so extrinsic and intrinsic barriers, inhibitory molecules that are present in the adult nervous system, represented by the alligators, molecules in myelin that are inhibitory, and the sharks, the proteoglycans, because they're cartilaginous fishes, and cartilage has a lot of proteoglycan. And when I drew these cartoons about 25 years ago, we had no idea that this cartoon uh, might actually exist, but it was the opposite of that, so I figured I'd just draw it, that there might be too much of a good thing in the injury, or some bizarre cocktail of factors that, that traps the axon in this strange state of dystrophy forever. So the axon is actually semi-happy. It's got all it needs, why leave? And it might actually make a connection with this beach chair. I'm gonna tell you who the beach chairs are shortly and you're gonna be quite surprised. But now we believe in our laboratory that it's this cartoon that represents what's really going on in spinal cord injury. That the axons are sort of happy because they've made a connection with an unusual cell in the lesion, and they persist for the rest of your life. And I'm going to also tell you that proteoglycans, those molecules that we know are important for repulsive inhibitory type interactions, when presented in the right way, actually favor a connection between the axon and the beach chair. So the proteoglycans are actually, in a sense, good guys. OK, so that's going to change the way we think about proteoglycans. And we're going to talk about receptors shortly. All right, so here are the proteoglycans, little stick diagrams of them you saw from Ravi, what they look like. There's a protein in the middle, and to it, which are attached these long chain disaccharide sugars, glycosaminoglycans, so we call them GAGs for short. And when we first started studying them a long time ago in my laboratory, we found them in places in the embryo where nerve fibers don't grow normally. So normal boundary regions, in the roof plate of the spinal cord that separates the dorsal columns, and in the periphery of the retina, this orange stuff. And axons in the embryo turn away from areas containing proteoglycans, a kind of a guardrail. We also found proteoglycans present in lesions, just like those that were made by Cajal. We lesion the spinal cord with a forceps or a knife, and you can see that these proteoglycans, which we can see using this antibody that lets us see the sugar chains on proteoglycans, there's an upregulation. It's white, more white, brighter. So after injury, proteoglycans 
upregulate. And we know that they are potently inhibitory. That was known long before we began to study proteoglycans. They are nature's barrier molecules. They're present in cartilage. Cartilage is not innervated. They're present in scar tissue in the periphery. Often scar tissue that's big doesn't get innervated. They're present in the stroma of the uterus to prevent the placenta from invading the uterus so deeply, which is an interesting thing that nature has done to create a normal barrier. But now we're finding these barriers in places where we don't want them, really, in the scar. And their job in the scar is to, probably, is to protect the injury site, but also, unfortunately, they block growth of nerve fibers. They're also present in the so-called perineuronal net, which I won't talk much about, around every connection. All the synapses in the brain are coated with a little substance, right? a net, a network or a ground substance full of proteoglycans, and that probably limits plasticity. You don't want the brain to change every day if the stabilize those connections, and so proteoglycans do that too. Now, I also want to point out that in the, in the lesion, the proteoglycans are not present in a stripe or a sharp edge. They're present in a gradient, higher near the lesion center and declining out near the, as you go farther away. So a gradient, high in the middle of the lesion and then going away. There's stuff that comes out of the blood that triggers the astrocytes those reactive cells that are pink in this picture, to make this proteoglycan. Now, we tested the role of proteoglycans by doing a transplant study many years ago. This was Stephen Davies, when he was in my laboratory. We micro-transplanted fully adult sensory neurons into the spinal cord above a lesion. The lesion is here, and we transplanted these fully adult neurons into the white matter, all right, where all the alligators are. And surprisingly, the axons from these cells, these are fully adult sensory neurons, could grow like crazy. It looks like almost green hair. And the, these axons are green because they come from a genetically modified mouse that's green. And so they can grow huge distances up and down. But when the axons got to the vicinity of the lesion, depending on how old the lesion is, what the axons do is go into the lesion they grow, regenerate well in white matter. When they get into the lesion, when it's young, they go into it, into the gradient, up the gradient, and they get stuck in the center. As the lesion ages, becomes older and more scarred with fibroblasts, the axons still can grow, even at three months, in the spinal cord. They get to the lesion, this is a picture that Ravi showed, and they get stuck again. Nine months after injury, this is an old rat, if you transplant sensory neurons into the spinal cord, after all of this damage has occurred, axons can still grow in the spinal cord well, not as well as they could at acute stages, and when they get down to the area of the lesion, they stop again. So there is growth potential in the spinal cord to allow axons to grow, but the lesion somehow traps them. This growth in the spinal cord from injected cells is gonna be very relevant to a talk you'll hear tomorrow by Mark Tuzinski right, about growing stem cells in, in the spinal cord uh, after injury. So keep that in mind. But we've seen that already with, with sensory neurons. All right, so the spinal cord allows for growth, except for the lesion. It's very, very inhibitory. Okay, let's talk about proteoglycans and how they work. This is a time-lapse movie of sensory neurons growing on a dish covered with a growth-promoting molecule called laminin. And you can watch the growth cones moving in real time, not real time, sped up time, and you can see that they have lots of processes and they're very dynamic as they grow. So these are little things called philopodia. So very dynamic. Now let's look to see what happens when we culture these neurons with a stripe of proteoglycan. So there's a stripe of proteoglycan, that's called agrican, mixed with laminin on a stripe, mixed with a stripe with just laminin. You can see that the growth cones turn. So these are stripes. Proteoglycan and laminin and laminin. You see the growth cone, it just turns. And you get these zones of growth and no growth. All right? And in the beginning, we thought, we had no idea why this occurred. It could have been due to the negative charge of those sulfate groups you heard about. We didn't really know. But the, at a sharp edge, growth cones turn. Now, I wasn't very satisfied in these early days that turning and growing was important for creating a dystrophic, stuck state of the axon. But these early studies 
showing repulsion by proteoglycans allowed us to test what's the inhibitory part of the molecule, the protein or the sugar. And we used this enzyme you heard about called chondroitinase that works like a scissors to clip off the chondroitin sulfate sugar chains down to a stub. And when we did that, these once forbidden territories of no growth were now grown over by all the cells from the sensory ganglia. So we know that the sugars are important. All right, but that's turning, not dystrophy. And in nature, proteoglycans aren't distributed in sharp edges, they're distributed in gradients, as I showed you. So let's build a gradient and see if that helps. So Veronica Tom in the laboratory created what we call our spot model. And this just takes advantage of a drying artifact. When you, when you dry proteins on a surface, they develop a little spot. It's like a spot of, of, of tea or coffee on linen. And by the way, the gradient making nature of drying coffee on linen has finally been worked out in terms of the physics in this paper, 2011. Hundreds of years of making ri spot rings right, on linen, they finally figured out how it works. So you can read that paper if you're interested. But you get gradients of molecules. And you can see the spot here. And notice that the proteoglycan in red increases as you go out. And laminin, which is in green, decreases. So we have two gradients. It's very much like the way these molecules are distributed in the real animal after injury. And now we've got a gradient, just like Mother Nature makes. In vivo, we've got it in vitro. And when we culture lots of neurons, in our spot assay, notice that at this outer edge, where there's a sharp line between proteoglycan in, in low abundance and high, axons turn. But here, in this gradient region, axons enter. And you can see one right here in low density. You see the axon goes into the gradient, just the way axons do in vivo. But in time lapse, when the axons go into the gradient, they go in and then they get stuck. They stop. And some axons bubble like this, right, in, in place, but they can't move. They never turn backwards, they just sit and bubble, looking a lot like some of Cajal's pictures. Now we've looked at these cultures over time. And look at these three growth cones. Look at this one on the bottom. It grows into the gradient and then it stops. Look at these growth cones. You see these little processes? Every one is stuck like glue. Look at this one on the lower right. The axons grow in, and then every single process is stuck like glue. All right? They are so stuck, they cannot move. And they cannot even form a growth cone. When they try, the growth cone becomes taken back up into the axon and is shipped back into these little blebs looking identical to some of Cajal's drawings. So when axons grow into a gradient of proteoglycan, just like in vivo, they get stuck. And they get so stuck so tightly, that's bad. They can't move, all right? Now, I'm going to tell you right now who the beach chair is that they get stuck on in vivo, but I'm, I, I don't have time. They're stem cells. In the human spinal cord, in a rat's spinal cord, after injury, your own stem cells fill the lesion. They're called oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. Right? And those are the cells that are the beach chairs. It's upon them that the axons are stuck. And they sit on these cells, and they actually make little synapses. They are home. They have all they need. But I can't, I can't tell you much more about that. Now, the question is, do you want to put in more stem cells? Do you want to alter them? But they're the beach chair in vivo. The question is, how in the world do we get them off? All right. Very fortunately, working with a guy named John Flanagan, over the last couple of years, we have found the first receptor for the inhibitory nature of proteoglycans. Now, you all know what a receptor is. It's something that cells have to let them talk to molecules. When we smell odors in the room, they bind to receptors in our nose, right? So receptors are very specific molecules that see things very specifically so cells can signal and know what they're talking to. And we found these receptors, finally, that, that, that bind to proteoglycans. They're the so-called LAR family, leukocyte common antigen-related phosphatases. That's not so much important what, you, you know, what, what it's called. They're enzymes, they're phosphatases. They remove phosphate groups from certain kinds of molecules. But what they are important for is to create strong adhesion when nerve cells are undergoing synaptogenesis, 
When they're making connections, these receptors see certain proteoglycans near the connections that they make, and they bind very tightly to them. So they're called Lar family receptors, very important, make strong adhesions, and they bind to the gag part of the molecule. So the receptor binds the sugar. And guess what? It's the same sugar Ravi was just talking about, the CSE form. That's who they like, all right? They also bind to other kinds of proteoglycans, which I'll tell you about in a second, called heparin sulfate proteoglycans, that promote growth. The same receptor, depending on who it binds to, heparin sulfate proteoglycans or chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans do opposite things. But I'll, I'll explain that in a second. All right, so there's two receptors. One is called sigma, one is called LAR. All right, so they have already been defined. Let's talk about how they work. All right, so what we found that it is if a growth cone is growing on laminin, these receptors, both LAR and sigma, are distributed uniformly. They make them, all right? But when the nerve cells get stuck, they upregulate the receptors in the tip of the growth cone. You can see it here and here. So the sticky receptor, when the growth cone goes into the gradient, goes up. So that means more flypaper, much more sticky, all right, to the point where there's just buckets of them, right? So the receptor goes up. The cell body over here is already stuck, plenty of receptor. So the receptor upregulates. So here's what we think is happening. This is, this is the way these receptors work. When a growth cone is growing, is motile, whether it sees HSPGs or laminin, you have the so-called dimerized form of the receptor, all right? That's this receptor. The receptor is off. And when the receptor is off, there is less adhesion and more growth. So off receptor. When the growth cone gets stuck, you see more of this so-called monomeric form, all right? The monomeric form is on. And CSPGs turn the receptor on, and that says more adhesion, really stuck, less growth. So how do we muck about with this? A guy named Frank Longo looked at this region called the wedge. So this is the crystal structure of the receptor. There's this little green thing that looks like a wedge. That's what's turning the switch on and off in the receptor. The wedge domain, when it sees certain kinds of molecules, Right, binds to the phosphatase region and just turns it off. All right, so when the wedge is stuck right, either to another molecule next door and dimerizes it, or maybe to itself, turns the receptor off. So what Frank Longo figured, all right, we'll throw in more wedge. And the wedge is a simple peptide we'll talk about shortly that just floods the neurons right, and tries to just switch right, from, from on to off. It's just a little simple switch. And we know that sigma has a wedge as well. So LAR has a wedge, and sigma has a wedge. And we can make peptides to those, these little wedge domains. We'll talk a little bit more about them shortly. And there are two of them. One we made for LAR, we call it ILP, ILP. And one we made to sigma, ISP. And we know that these peptides go into the cell. I'll tell you in a second about this TAT domain. So, Here's, here are the two geniuses in my lab. This is Brad. There's Jared, who've invented these peptides for us. Uh, here are the sequences. They're highly conserved between mouse, rat, and human. It's a, li it's a little group of, of amino acids, right, that are shared. So the LAR has this. There's the wedge domain, sigma. There's a third one called delta. Don't have to worry about it. It's not in the adult nervous system. And we designed these peptides with a thing called TAT. TAT this is called TAT domain. TAT is based on HIV infectability, right? It gets the peptide into the cell. It's, just, it's like a shuttle bus. It just moves the peptide from outside to inside. And we generated these wedge domain peptides, and we asked, well, if our hypothesis is correct that too much adhesion is bad, throwing in the peptides should loosen adhesion and make things better. So we went to our spot model. Here's the control. And you see the nerve fibers get stuck in the rim. And when we throw in this peptide, this one ISP, and this one ILP, one to sigma, and this one is to LAR, nerve cells cross the spot. 
We have never seen anything ever all by itself that will allow nerve fibers to cross that spot except for chondroitinase. And this is how well chondroitinase works and the peptides work far better. Why? Because when these peptides get into the cell, they tell the nerve cell, this is heparin sulfate proteoglycan grow faster. It thinks it sees heparin sulfate. Not only does it not see the proteoglycan as a barrier, it has now got extra fuel. So now it grows faster and avoids the barrier. So they grow even better. Now, do they grow better because they're less adhesive? So we did a shake assay. Here's the shake assay in the lower right. If we culture adult sensory neurons in a substrate of proteoglycan and laminin, right, they grow. And even though they're on proteoglycan, without the peptide, when we shake the hell out of them, you can see they shake artifact, but they don't fall off. They are stuck. But when we add the peptide, either ILP or ISP, right, we know that these nerve fibers now grow and they grow better, but when we shake, they fall off, which is suggests they're too tight. It proves our hypothesis that too tight is bad, all right? Too loose is bad as well. All right, so now what, what do we do to show how these work? If you look at in vitro assays, here's time lapse again of these spots. You can see here's a stuck growth cone. That's a control. But in the presence of these peptides, watch the growth cones. They just don't give up. They just keep growing and growing and growing and growing. They fall back, and then they go. They fall back, and then they go. All right, so in the presence of these peptides in vitro in our assays, they just don't get dystrophic because they don't see the proteoglycan. And they keep going, and this one actually crosses to the other side. What if we had both peptides? That's bad because now things are too loose, and all the nerve fibers fall off so they can hardly grow at all. So you need just the right balance. All right, now, how do we test this in vivo? So what have we done? So this is our model. We use an infinite horizon device, and we hit the spinal cord as hard as we possibly can. It's 250 kilodynes, all right, to create a contusive injury that's like a human injury. We give subcutaneous injections of the peptide. All we do is just give shots in the back, underneath the skin, just above the lesion. Right? That's all we do. And we wait, we, in this first series of experiments, we waited one day before we started, all right? We give vehicle, which has got a little bit of DMSO. What's DMSO? It's another penetrant. It helps get stuff into cells. So we can get to the spinal cord by just injecting under the skin, because it penetrates all the tissues, all right? We give the ILP, the IS peptide, or both in vivo. We start 24, after, 24 hours after, and we gave injections for seven weeks. We had no idea. How long to go, we just went as long as we could. And we do testing, BBB, measurements. We look at urination. We look at grid walk. We do catwalk. And we, be, we do bladder an analysis. So we look at lots of things in our laboratory. And here's what we found. And we're really pretty excited about this. So if you look at the BBB score over time, this is all double-blind experiments now. Notice that the controls in red get to about a BBB score of 10 which is an, an occasional weight-bearing step. Tail is down. There's no coordination. The animals are essentially paralyzed, right? They're not completely paralyzed. They're not down to a zero, but they're severely handicapped. If we use the ILP peptide or both peptides, there's no difference in vivo. In vitro, ILP worked. But notice that the IS peptide, around 42 days, the animals start to improve and really markedly so. If you look down here at the scatter plot, notice that if you look at the IS-treated animals, we have responding animals and non-responding animals. There's some that don't improve at all, about half, but others, about 50%, improve unbelievably. Some almost to normal. And you can watch the movies. This is, you can watch the, cat, the computer look at the catwalk. These are actually different animals. This is a control animal. This is a treated animal. I mean, this is a BBB difference of about seven points. All right, so tail is up. There's, there's coordination between left and right hind limbs. Um, I mean, that's really remarkable. I mean, this animal the week before was at a 20 BBB, which is only one point uh, short of normal walking. 
So they really improve uh, uh, walking behavior. This is grid walk analysis. Here's a control. Look at the number of footfalls. Notice the is treated animal, far fewer footfalls. All right. Again, responders and non-responders. So some animals do quite well, and some animals, right, don't respond. That, that's life. All right. We'll talk about why we have responders and non-responders shortly. Five more minutes. All right. Here's so we looked at urination in these animals. We use these special kinds of cages. They're called metabolic cages. The animals have free access to water and food, and what they do is to urinate. And the computer tells us each step is a urination event, right? Each step up is volume, and, and each horizontal line is time. And rats pee a lot. That's what they do when they're in this cage. And they, they pee about twice an hour. They're in there for 16 hours. That's 32 pees a night, all right? If you're injured with a spinal cord injury and you're a rat, you can still pee a little bit. Now, humans cannot. Rats are somewhat different. They develop reflexive urination, but it's very poor. The number of urinations goes way down. The bladder is incredibly filled with urine. Some can dribble out from time to time, right? But they do very badly. In the presence of the, of the peptide, all right, some animals improve to normal. Some animals don't improve. Right? Here's some physiology to show you. So, so that here again, urination event should be high. See lots more with the ISP treatment than, than the others. Again, responders and non-responders. And so if you look at physiology uh, of the bladder, it's actually much restored. This is normal physiology of the sphincter and the bladder. Um, what we're doing is pumping urine, not urine, saline into the bladder and then doing physiology. You can see this is normal physiology. You get these steps up and pulsatile behavior of the sphincter. That's typical of rat. Here's a lesioned animal. You see it's all screwed up. And then here is an ISP-treated animal. Much better. Not perfect, but way better. Now, the question is, you have responders and non-responders. Do the responders respond to everything? So is just one group of animals gets better, or do all animals get better, but with different things? So this is a so-called Venn diagram. It turns out that all the animals, or almost all, improve. 12 of 14 get, get much better, but not in everything. Some recover, right? Only BBB score, right, improves, but not grid walk. Some animals recover urination only. Some animals get both, two things, and some animals get all. But in the end, all animals recover. Almost. So this is really very exciting. So the conclusions uh, of this first talk. So the scar is really important. But I told you also that those growth cones get stuck on proteoglycans made by stem cells. All right, so the scar is one thing, but that, that entropic, that, that like entrapment is really important for regeneration failure. I've shown you also that if we inact inactivate these LAR peptides, especially the sigma, the sigma receptor with, it, with this peptide, right, that frees up the growth cones, and they can still struggle through. And just simple subcutaneous injection of the peptide after a very severe injury allows remarkable recovery. But not all animals recover the same thing, but many of them get better. Now, what's the mechanism that's behind this? We just don't know. We don't have any anatomy yet. We have no idea where the peptide's working. Could be working in the spinal cord, could be working in the brainstem, could be working in the cortex, or all those different places. But the simplicity of this approach, I think, offers all kinds of potential uh, future uh, experiments in combination with all the other things you've heard. What about chronic injury? All right, so we're now starting to do those experiments. Right, this is, I, I'm, I can't tell you that if we give you injections of this peptide, you're going to get up and walk. I, I just can't, we don't know yet. We don't know what the optimal dose is, and we're working that out now in our acute injury. And then we're going to move towards lots of other different kinds of models in our laboratory, which have shown that chondroitinase, the enzyme itself, can work to restore plasticity in a respiratory model, for instance. So we're, now we're going to use the peptide. And stay tuned for tomorrow, because I'll tell you a lot more about chronic injury uh, when, when I discuss our next part of our, our story. Thank you very much. Jerry. Jerry.